Welcome everyone to the Dallas Model A Ford Club's presentation on all you want to know about carburetors. We hope that before the day is over, you'll know a great deal about identification and how to rebuild a Model A Zenith carburetor. For information for me, how many of you have a copy of the Royal Hungerford, Piggy's the name. Tester. My name is Royal Hungerford, they call me Piggy. I like your hat. Thanks. All right. Now, very important is the pink sheet, revision two. Because in Would the you like a banana? Is a copy of what we see in back of me. In 1927, when the Ford engine was being designed and built, it was due to produce 40 horsepower. The first engines that they had for production testing produced only a miserable 22 horsepower, not much more than a Model T. And certainly not enough power to get to motor the Model A down the highway at 60, 65 miles an hour they were designed to run. They thought they were really in trouble. They called in a new Ford engineer, Harold Hicks, who had been assigned to the Ford Trimotor Division. Bon bon. Completely re redesigned the intake and bon bon. manifolds oh. and included a, bon a bon. type carburetor. All the carburetors on the Model T's had been Hollies. He selected the Zenith Detroit Corporation to design a carburetor for our new Model A Fords. It was a bit different in that it had two jets in it to give it a little more power. And it did produce the necessary 40 horsepower. Now there was another problem then. Zenith Detroit was a small French company with a branch in, in Detroit and they did not have the production capability to give Ford enough carburetors to put on the cars he was going to build. So they made an arrangement with the Holly Corporation, his old supplier, whereby that they would build the same carburetor, mark them a little different perhaps, so that they would have enough to have on the cars when they were ready to start rolling them off the production line. The first carburetor that was designed by Zenith had the word Zenith on the bowl with no number, nothing on the throat here. If you look at the little pink sheet that we discussed a while ago, you can see the description of it. On the back side of the carburetor is a small pin that held the double Venturi in place, kept it from moving, and the Z actually is on the back side. This is a very rare carburetor, hard to find. Holly also supplied a double Venturi carburetor, all the parts interchange, except that they marked theirs with an H over H so that they could tell the difference in the manufacturer. Now we've mentioned double Venturis. Here is a double Venturi that's a part. You can look and see the second Venturi that's in it. The little slot in it goes on the pin, I said, that's on the back side of this one so it would hold it in the right position. We'll set it down here where you can see it. When all this is over, we want everybody to come up and look. You can pick these rascals up. Just be sure to put them back on the right peg. The top of the carburetor is identical to this one. It has the small H. Now then, there was one more double Venturi carburetor. Zenith made the same as below, except that they put the pin on the front. So when we're talking about different carburetors, it's really just different visual changes that you might see when you raise the hood on the car on a car and look at it, or if you were judging it. It still has a double venturi. They simply pinned it on the front instead of the rear. For some reason, they put a boss on the back. They could have done it either way. Now, then those are the three double venturi carburetors and the one we've got taken apart here. The double venturis were good until about May or April of 1928, somewhere along right about into here. All of them had the choke arms with no lower level. We'll discuss that a little more when we get down to the hardware that were used on the different carburetors. Production changes decided that they would no longer use the double Venturi. They went to a single, which meant they lost the pins where the little boss was pinned in, and they changed the jets internally just a little, moved them around. Instead of being in line, they were offset. So this is an identical carburetor, except it does not have the boss on it. It's still marked H over H. Thank you for
Fred. Zenith's first single Venturi carburetor had bosses both sides, but it did not have any pins in it, quite similar to this one. They're still marked Zenith on the top. Holly made one that was a change that they had H on the top and nothing on the bottom. There's no mark on the bowl. There's no H on here. Another, if we took this one apart, I'm sure there's either an H or a Holly marked on the inside. Zenith made uh, one more carburetor for 1928 in that there was no bosses whatsoever on either side. They finally, in their mold making, decided to just take them off and drop them. They still marked Zenith. This one has a big old G on it. You'll see a lot of other marks. Those are simply mold marks. They mean nothing. It was something for them to keep up with and manufacture. The last Holly carburetor made for 1928 had absolutely nothing on it. No H's, either where, no marking on the bowl. This is a not too easy carburetor to find either. This particular carburetor is going to be a new one. It's not on your pink sheet that you're looking at. It has a raised letter Z on the throat, a raised letter Zenith with no number. It was described in the Model A News with photographs about it. It will be added when the next edition of the judging standards comes out. So we wanted to show you what it looks like here. Now then, Ford had some problems of returns. So a directive was issued that all Zenith manufactured were marked Zenith 1 on the bowl, same letter Z on the top, and all Holly carburetors were marked Zenith dash two on the bowl. Here, it's raised letter Zenith two, nothing on the throat. They didn't perhaps like this, so they had indented letter Zenith twos also. So we had one, two, three, four carburetors that could be used in 1929. You've got a car for judging, you could successfully use any one of these four carburetors on your car. Now up to now, all of the choke levers and throttle levers have been forged brass, with the exception of some of the real early ones. And Ford was fighting the depression in 1930. They were lowering the price of the cars and they tried to lower the price of the manufacture of the cars. So they simply changed the carburetors from forged brass to stamped steel. They were either cad plated or left unfinished. We've got some of both of them here on the board. So in 1930, we only had two carburetors that you could use. The Zenith 1 stamped with Z on the throat, the Holly built carburetor, Zenith Mark II. Now Ford did come in production with their own carburetors. Now we have three people making carburetors. Very few of carburetor number 17 were made. It is a non-side bowl, but it is a Zenith 3 with a marking on it. It's a very thin casting. Matter of fact, it weighs about a pound less, the whole carburetor, than all the others. They reinforced the upper portion where it bolted onto the manifold because it was very prone to break across there. And even if you find them nowadays, they're usually broken or damaged in some way. This particular carburetor belongs to Ed Eaton. I have never been able to find one, so if anybody out there has one in one of their chicken boxes, I wish you'd get in touch with me. One of the northern states, Pennsylvania, I believe it was, passed a law that they could not have a gas fitting inside the car. So they had to redesign all of their supply lines in the car and the gas tank and gave birth to what we now call the indented firewall. Since they lost the filter off the firewall, they had to add a filter somewhere, so they hung it on the side of the carburetor. It meant they had to do a new top. The bottom stayed the same. And put a small filter and with a drain on the bottom so they could clean it out. Zenith made one, Mark Zenith one. Holly made one, Mark Zenith two. And Ford made their famous Zenith three. A lot of times they had a three on the throat up here. Might have been upside down, but there were other numbers on there, a one or a six or a nine. And this particular one doesn't even have any mark on it. So uh, 
We've shown finishes on here. If you use CAD plating, I'd use CAD on everything. If you use new nickel plate, I'd have all pieces nickel plated. This particular one is unfinished, which is acceptable to the judging standards. Now let's talk a little bit about the hardware. In early 27 and 8, they used a steel forging for both the throttle shaft and for the choke, and it did not have a lower leg on it. These are original. This one has a small Z stamped on the back. This one has a DF on the front for, for Detroit Foundry. Now, I've never really seen an original brass choke lever with no lower leg. I've been assured that there probably are such people. The ones that we've showed you over here are, to be honest, somebody has cut the lower leg off. But this is an original. <coughs> They had a steel forging with the lower leg when they added it, and the idea of adding it, they could put a little wire on there and poke it through the radiator, and perhaps you could try to start the thing by yourself. It was real cold. You could choke it and crank it at the same time. They dropped the steel forgings. They were expensive to make. They went to brass forgings through the dates, and those of you that have your standards out, this is very well explained in some of the pink pages. The brass forgings were either unplated dull nickel plated. This one is an original that you can still see the original nickel plating on. It's not all wore off. Then they went to the steel stampings. There was a little different throttle shaft for the Zenith 3 carburetor. It's a little fatter and it's a little thicker metal. And you, if you, after the meeting's over, you can come up and look at these and you can really see the difference. Also, the choke lever was a little different. It was rounded over. We had five different choke drivers, a brass to start, a brass with a steel insert, a steel one with uh, a pin in it to keep the little rod in, and uh, a steel one with no pin, it was pressed in, and then they went to one that was staked on the side. They must have had some complaints of this pin pulling loose. I won't get too much in detail on the air adjusting screws. There are about four different ones that were used. There were three different screens to filter the gasoline, there were three different bolts, a half inch thick head, a 9 sixteenths thick head, and a 9 sixteenths thin head. On all of the real early carburetors, ones that we probably would call AR, they used a lead washer under the drain plug at the bottom under the main jet. I think from then on they probably were just a red fiber washer. There was a special thin lock washer that was under the bolts that held them together. Now you may have noticed that we put some additional carburetors up here a while ago too. I've got one here I call Brand X. Uh, you've looked at a lot of carburetors down here. What's wrong with this carburetor? Anybody out there? It doesn't have a choke driver on it. This probably came off of an industrial engine. The second carburetor is a Simmons. These are all aftermarket, but you may find them on a car somewhere. Simmons was a high performance carburetor. Probably cost two or three times what a regular carburetor costs, but they did improve the running of the car of the car. This one is the regular carburetor, and they actually made a side bolt Simmons. They have a real nice little brass tag on the top side of them. Look at them when you come up and look. Had to show you a plain old Model B. You'll see some people that think they ought to put them on their Model A. It's a little larger carburetor, but it was from 32 on up, and I don't think it runs any better. You can get a good carburetor that would came on it like Henry built it. We'll leave it on there. Now, and I've got what's called here a Sears carburetor. This one's unusual. It has no markings, but if you look very close right here, it's been ground off. I felt that uh, Holly probably made these, and they were sold through Sears and Montgomery Ward and Western Auto. And uh, that way they didn't have to put their name on them and they didn't make anybody unhappy. Now then, does anybody out there have some questions? Oh, yeah, over here, question? Uh, yeah, uh, excuse me, yes, I have one. Uh, uh, how do I tell a 1929 Model A from a 1930 model? And by the way, where do I find one of those restored carbohydrates? A uh, replacement what, sir? Uh, oh, uh, excuse me, carburetor, sir. I mean, like those objects you've been pointing to on the board there, sir. Are you a member of our club or one of the clubs in the area? Well, no. Uh, actually, I just inherited my Model A from my great Aunt Tilly. This is my first meeting. Uh, one.
wonderful, wonderful. I don't know if I can really answer that right now, but I have a friend that will probably answer anything you need to know about it. He's going to tell you how to make a Model A Zenith carburetor run. Fred? Thanks, Lloyd. Over the past few years, several excellent articles on the subject of overhauling the carburetor have appeared in Model A News and in the Restorer magazines. Nonetheless, just to refresh our memory and to stay tuned up, let's do a basic overview of the process of rebuilding the carburetor. But first, and before we get started, I'd like to see if anyone here has a carburetor that needs rebuilding. Uh, I have one. Excuse me. Uh, here, I have mine. I have mine right here. My car just broke down right in front of the building. Well, even though you're not a member, let's take a look at the carburetor. Uh, Piggy Hungerford. Hi, Piggy. Fred Carlton. <laughs> well, that's certainly an original. Well, yes, my great aunt Tilly was an original, too. You know, that carburetor is older than I am. Well, that's certainly nice to know. Of course, we'll have to start by taking it apart. Remove the original 3 8 inch body bolt, which will allow separation of the upper and lower body assemblies. Replace the main bolt with a longer, modern bolt, making sure that the bolt is screwed all the way in to avoid damaging the threads. and tap the two halves apart. If you're lucky, the Venturi can be saved, but if rusty, most will break. If so, pick it out later with a sharp tool. Also, plan on using heat in other places if your carburetor is rusty. Use a small tip and apply heat to the outer castings in the several places where parts are likely to be frozen. Be careful about heating the small brass pieces, as they can be damaged. Spend plenty of time and heat until the color shows. If the choke lever is frozen, then apply heat to the ends of the choke shaft too have a bucket of water standing by and quench the whole assembly at one time. Now set about to remove the small parts. Remove the small nut on the end of the choke shaft, then the choke lever. Now honestly, you are seeing this carburetor come apart for the very first time. The two little 540 screws which hold the choke plate on the shaft. Heat hopefully has loosened these up for us. Center the choke plate. Remove the choke plate from the shaft. And then remove the shaft itself. Then the choke driver and the gas adjusting needle and housing. Two sizes were used, 7 16 inch and 13 30 seconds. We believe the 13 30 seconds was original. An 11 millimeter deep socket like this one works real well on the original size. If your carburetor is an early one with a brass needle seat threaded into the bottom of the valve well, then try to remove it with a flat bladed screwdriver just the right size. However, if it will not come out, you might be better off to leave it in, rather than to try drilling it out. Turn the bottom casting over and remove the drain plug. Three jets with their fiber washers will need to be removed. The main jet is right here. See how easily they come apart after heating and quenching. The cap jet comes out from the inside very nicely with a 5 16 inch nut driver. It's a good idea to take out these jets before removing the broken venturi so as to not damage them. And the small compensator jet 
is unscrewed from the bottom of the bowl. If any of the jets are broken off, they must be drilled out and the hole tapped with a special size 1034 tap available at most antique auto suppliers. This leaves only the secondary well, a very few double venturi carburetors and all single venturi carburetors had a brass secondary well. It is probably the hardest part to remove. If it will not come out with the correct size screwdriver and a firm hand, then try heating the cast iron again all around the secondary well, quench it, and try again. If all else fails, then drill it out. If it starts spinning with your drill, try wedging it through the compensator jet hole. Here we've used a 5 16 left-hand drill, which will often dig into the brass and spin it out of the hole. Once done, clean up the threads with a 3 8 24 tap. Now we can finally remove the broken venturi. We have taken an old sharpened screwdriver and used it like a chisel. The venturi was die cast pot metal and age has caused it to swell and become very brittle. Chip away at it very carefully, one section at a time, till a section breaks loose. Being careful not to break the little lip on the inside of the housing. Let's move on up to the top. Look what's in the Venturi, a great big Texas dirt dauber's nest. Remove the float pin. Then the float. Unscrew the idle jet with a 9 30 seconds wrench. It does not have a washer. It has a taper fit. Then we can unscrew the float valve. Let's use heat again. On the idle air screw. And on the filter screen. This particular brass screen is in poor condition. And we need a new one here. A bit more heat on the air idle screw and on the throttle housing. Also, heat the idle stop screw and butterfly screws. Again, scare the hot metal with a cold bath. A good application of WD-40 will help. Start by removing the idle speed stop screw. Then the two screws which secure the throttle plate to the shaft. Removal of the brass throttle plate may take a little force but try at least to protect the edges from damage. Pull out the throttle shaft and unscrew the idle air adjust screw. Remove the filter screen assembly. Somebody at some point in time has already rounded this one off for us just to make it difficult. Probably the screen and ferrule will not come out with the plug because our heating may have melted the solder. So from the bottom side through the float valve opening, take a bent nail with a flat end and drive out the ferrule and screen. This is important. Make sure the ferrule is out. There now. We have removed all the hardware and we can clean up both of the castings. First a wire brushing, but not chemical stripping. It can damage the threads. Bead blasting is probably the best of all and it also helps to open the internal passageways. Chase all the threads with a tap. The idle air needle valve and all jets are a 1034 size. Clean up all the remaining threads with the correct size tap. Should the top flange threads be stripped, drill out oversize and install threaded steel inserts. 
In the bottom half of the carburetor, three internal passageways form an underground supply network for the openings which require fuel from the float chamber. Five such openings are connected together. If nothing is stopped up, they are common with each other. They are the threaded opening of the fuel adjusting chamber, a passage hole at the bottom of the float chamber, a threaded seat with the compensating jet, the top of the secondary well, and the threaded seat for the cap jet. Color them red if you like. Additionally, there are two openings which are at each end of a passageway. The hole at the side of the float bowl and the threaded hole for the main jet. Let's color them yellow. Plug up any three openings in our red network and apply air. Poof! There goes the cotton. The passageway is open. Now let's check it another way. Put a little cotton in the needle adjust feed hole. Apply air to the cap jet hole. And there she blows. Then check the main jet to float bowl passage on our yellow circuit. With the drain plug in place on the bottom of the carburetor, air should pass from the float bowl to the main jet. If any of the passages are clogged up, clean up the accessible ones with a piece of wire or a small drill or anything else which might open them up. Then test again to see if air will pass between the openings. If they are still clogged up, you can try soaking the castings in a strong ammonia solution or in a carburetor cleaner. But more likely than not, you will need to drill out one or both of the long passages which are capped with brass plugs. Here and here. Center punch. Use a number 45 drill and drill out the brass plug carefully, following the angle of the passageway. Use a small wire. Find the passage hole to the cap jet or the secondary well, as they're made both ways. Replacement plugs are available from your favorite antique parts supply. Zenith plugs were rounded on top, and Holly made theirs flat. A good way to check this important operation of the gas adjusting needle and seat is to set up the carburetor with water as you see it here. With the secondary well and the compensating jet closed off, air should pass as the needle is opened up and should stop when the needle is closed down. If the needle does not seat properly, then dress the needle seat down at the bottom of the hole. Use fine or extra fine lapping compound. The tool can be made by soldering together two old needles and grinding off the thread so it will turn in the needle housing. Of course, if you're really serious about carburetor rebuilding, you can make up a set of tools which will allow you to install a threaded brass needle seat, even in the later castings that had just a cast iron seat. Lloyd puts one in all the carburetors he rebuilds. Sometimes the cast iron seat just won't hold. After drilling with a number 18 drill, Tap at least six threads with a number 1034 tap. Make a guide from a fitting and use a 5 16 inch countersink to cut a flat recess for a new replacement gas needle seat. Moving on up now to the upper half. This one is easy, for there is only one passageway. It goes from the idle jet hole up past the idle air adjusting needle to a small hole in the side of the carburetor throat. Screw the idle jet in place and attach a short piece of rubber or plastic tubing. Suck on the idle jet with the small hole in the throat closed off with your thumb. No air should pass until you open up the idle air adjust. Find a needle which will seat. 
it is important that it will completely shut off the air. Some are too long, others are simply too short, which causes the spring to collapse and stop the needle before it seats. Align and drill out the throttle shaft holes to 5 16 inch for brass bushings. Brass tube stock 5 16 OD and 9 32nd ID is available at most train and hobby shops. Mark it and cut it to lengths. And install the bushings with a steel epoxy. This is JB Weld. Even though badly worn like this one, Lloyd likes to use the original shafts and builds them up with solder and dress them back down to original size. Only moderate heat should be used, such as a good soldering iron or this little propane unit. Heat gently and evenly, just enough to make the solder fill in the low spots. The solder is removed easily with an ordinary file. Take your time and round it off. We need to get a nice, tight fit. Come back with some emery cloth to smooth it out and to further round off the repair. You can dress it down, try it for a fit, dress it down some more if necessary. This original shaft has been built up with solder, filed, and dressed down for a pretty close fit. It needs to fit close, but also turn freely and smoothly. Make final adjustments as necessary with a fine grade of emery taped to a flat file. A Model A will not idle properly if there is an air leak around the shaft. This is the kind of fit we want. Now about the four jets, the compensator jet, main jet, and the cap jet for the bottom half and the idle jet for the top. Clean them up. Blow into one end while holding your finger over the other end. They must not leak and the threads must be good. The orifice in each jet needs to be the correct size. For instance, in the cap jet, a number 60 wire drill should go. And a number 61 really should not go. So this one needs to be soldered and redrilled. We start with about a 16th inch drill to clean up the tip of the jet so it will solder. Then with a solder gun, we can apply acid core solder and fill just the tip of the jet. We're going to file the solder flat. Countersink the center with our larger drill. It only takes a little pressure to carve out a nice center. Watch your fingers. These drills are small and sharp, just like a needle. And then we'll drill it out with a correct number 60 drill. And hopefully, the number 61 drill will not go. This jet should work perfectly. On the secondary well, clean out the two lower holes with a number 54 drill. It goes all the way through. The one small hole at the top of the secondary well should be cleaned out with a number 70 drill. All of the remaining jets should also be sized out. It's difficult to remember all of the drill sizes for all of the jets, so we prepared this chart. A copy is included with your video cassette. Using this method of sizing the jets, you can be 99% sure that they will flow correctly. Zenith at random flow tested the jets, and if you wish to do the same, here's a procedure which will work. Using water, we have set up 36 inches of pressure from an overflow at the top of this 3 quarter inch pipe down to the jet. The stream coming from this main jet should be 2 or 3 inches before it breaks up. Also, if there is a nice, clean hole in the jet, the stream of water will be straight coming out of the tip. If it's not, or should you discover that the flow is too much, 
then plan to resolder and drill it out again. The main jet should pass 70 to 75 cc's of water in a 30 second test. How about that? Just what we wanted. Once set up, we will of course want to flow test all of the jets. The specifications are here on this flow chart and a copy is included with your video cassette. After the restoration work is done, Paint the outside of the carburetor with a low luster, gas resistant black lacquer. Ditzler Formula DIA 9468 is an excellent one. The brass plugs should be natural finish, so dot them with a little Vaseline before painting the castings. The stop pins, however, need a coat of aluminum paint. Now comes the fun part, putting it back together. If yours has one, screw in the gas adjusting needle seat with its gasket. Then comes the gas adjusting needle and housing with a little Teflon tape. Back off a little on the needle so it won't bottom out as you tighten it. Incidentally, in production, Ford used both brass and steel gas adjusting needles with the brass seats. We are putting it back together now, just the way we took it apart except that we have restored all the parts and everything fits real nice. On the shaft, the countersunk holes are on the top and the threads are on the bottom. The air shutter itself is bright cadmium plated. Install the choke driver and the arm, brass, cad, or nickel plated. Be sure the bump on the arm fits into the groove on the choke driver. Put on the lock washer and the thick CAD plated nut. The secondary well all cleaned up with the tiny holes clear. Be sure it goes all the way to the bottom. Screw in the main jet with its fiber washer. The compensator jet, again with its gasket, here at the bottom of the gas bowl. This meters gasoline to the secondary well. Take a 5 16 inch nut driver and set the cap jet with its fiber washer in the threaded hole right next to the main jet. The top of both the main and cap jets should be 3 eighths of an inch below the top of the casting. Use thicker or thinner gaskets under the jets to do this. Install the drain plug. Remember, Lloyd said to use a lead washer under the double venturi carburetors and a reddish fiber washer on all the rest. The bottom casting is now complete. Note the finish on the fitted throttle arm. The shaft was not plated. Install the throttle plate the correct way and tap it in. Select the proper length Philister head idle adjust screw and screw it into the throttle assembly until the throttle plate is just cracked open. Put in the fitted idle adjust screw, bottom it, then back off a turn and a half. Push and twist the needle in the float needle valve a few times to seat it. Most originals are still good. Install it with its fiber washer and make it tight. Two floats were used. On the early ones, the soldered seam was close to the top. Bending this small tab on the hinge prevents the float from falling too far. It's important that we install the float with the soldered seam parallel to the top of the carburetor. Adjust this with thicker or thinner gaskets. 
install the filter screen with its gasket, and then the idle jet with a 9 32nd inch wrench. Remember, this jet has no gasket. It's a taper fit. Make sure the Venturi fits well in both halves. Since our original was broken, we are using a reproduction. Install a new gasket. And very carefully put the two halves together. The idle jet should not bottom out in the secondary well. Install the main body bolt with the thin blue steel lock washer. Three different bolt heads were used. We are now ready to check the gasoline level and the operation of the float valve. The correct gas level is 5 eighths of an inch below the gasket. We've moved outside to be safe because we must use gasoline and we've installed a fuel level gauge. We got this one from Bratton's Antique Ford Parts. Pour in some gas, the bowl will fill, and hopefully it will cut off at 5 eighths of an inch. If too low, it will produce a lean mixture. If too high, gas overflows from the jets. Should the gas level rise, the float valve is leaking. It will be constructed of the best materials by the best men to be hired after the simplest designs modern engineering can devise. Thank you, Henry.